Welcome to this Absolute Beginner's Guide to Rule the Waves 2, Part 4, The Wartime Navy. My name's Dickie, and this is my games analysis channel where I try to take a look at some of the games I enjoy more closely. To think about the wartime navy, you need a war. If we have a little look at where we're at now, we're in peace. So I'm just going to push this game forward a few turns until we get to the eve of war. Colonial crisis with Russia has arisen. You're asked for your recommendations. So uh, we must safeguard our interests. Well, budget, prestige, double tension. That's war, basically. And boom. As soon as we OK this, this will go shooting up into red. Take tensions from the current 10 up to 50 or 60. And that brings us to the point. What do we do now? How do we manage our Navy in wartime? So five things to consider. What war winning strategy are we going to deploy? What are we going to build during wartime that can arrive and actually help out? How are we going to deploy our forces? How are we going to decide which battles we're going to accept and which, if any, we're going to decline? And what do we think about peace? What are we really aiming for here? So let's accept war. Here we are. It's September 1903, after a month of war, which is a bit odd because it's only just happened and we didn't have any opportunity to react, but there you go. War winning strategies. Number one, probably the most fun, certainly the one I enjoy, is just get in there and win battles. Sink ships, crank up the victory points, get some bonus prestige for epic victories, and bring your opponent to their knees by sinking their navy. It's a lot of fun. Number two, blockade. Starve them. Have a bigger fleet in their home area than they do. If you manage that, every turn you will generate a few hundred victory points, which isn't many. It's small beer compared to a decent naval victory. Basically, the public doesn't get enormously excited by relentless blockade in the same way that they get cheered up by a big naval victory. But the impact on uh, this figure, the unrest level. So currently our unrest is at level two, which is all right, could be better, but recently it had been as high as level five during the economic downturn. We pushed that down a little bit by wisely giving up some money for social measures to be passed by parliament. And now it's only at level two, which gives us greater resilience if the Russians manage to blockade us. A close to blockade, if you can't do that, is to undertake a trade war against their merchant ships. If you do blockade, there are no merchant ships on the high seas, so there's no point trying to sink them with submarines or sink them with raiding cruisers. But if you can't blockade, then either doing a submarine war or a cruiser raider war can be a really effective way of bringing an opponent to their knees, particularly if their navy is actually a bit tasty and a bit too much for your navy to manage. At the moment, although submarines are available to be built, I haven't built them because they're super, super early and they're only coastal submarines, which can only operate in your home area. Now, as chance would have it, Russia is also in the same home area, so that would have worked. And I could build a ton now, but they would take a goodly while to be ready. Let me just go build submarine, coastal. Um, they would take 14 months, which is a fair chunk uh, in a war. So I'm not going to do that. I could set many of my cruisers to be raiders and send them out. It's a bit expensive because not in monetary terms, but, you know, these are proper warships. They're really, really good, and they have other jobs to do. They are there to support your destroyers. They are there to do coastal raids. They are there to scout for your fleet in a main fleet engagement. You, you don't want to denude your fleet of cruisers if you can possibly help it. The game does allow you to build armed merchant cruisers. Merchant ships fitted out with some guns and sent out onto the high seas to be sneaky and go and sink some ships. So here's an auto design. 
for a 2600, which is kind of a, a middling size. Its speed is only 12 knots. You know, these, these are not intended to stand up against a proper cruiser and come out well. So don't fall into the trap of increasing all the armaments up to the highest level that you can as if it were going to go toe to toe with the cruiser or increasing its speed to, I don't know, 20 knots or something like that. A better tactic actually is to go and minimize it. I think you can take it down to 1800. Let me just double check that. Yep. Just ignore the rest of the stuff. So 1800. At 1800, I can't have torpedoes, but that's okay because I'm not seeking to fight cruiser. I probably am overgunned. Yeah, okay. So let's reduce some of these guns. Let's get rid of the midships. It still might think I'm overgunned. Okay, it's fine, and I'm overmined. In the early game, the only ships that can carry mines are armed merchant cruisers. So this actually looks pretty good. I didn't point out the cost, but I think we've nearly halved the cost from the original, which means we can build double the amount of cruisers. I'm not going to build this because my hope is that we can blockade the Russians. So let's have a look at the map. Uh, let's zoom in to Europe and put the strength bars on. And as you can see, the gray, you're always gray, is higher than the red. That difference will only increase. So. You can see here, Russia has four battleships, two armed cruisers, five light cruisers, 18 destroyers, and a corvette for a total strength of 84. We have a similar force, but with a slight advantage in cruisers and destroyers and a blockade strength of 99. The numbers in bracket here at the end is your blockade strength. The blockade strength really depends on your battleships and your cruisers. You don't get much at all for destroyers and you don't get anything at all for the corvettes. Of course, if we manage to sink any Russian ships, then that figure will come down and blockade will properly start to set in. We do have responsibilities across the globe so over in uh, Northeast Asia, the Russians and ourselves have naval bases, but they don't matter in this instance because they haven't deployed any ships to the Far East and we haven't either because we're playing with a small fleet. If we'd gone with a, a larger fleet, then we would have ships out there. Our winning strategy is absolutely to go out there and win some battles and crank up some victory points. And at the same time, to blockade the Russians and make them sweat until they crumble. There are two other things you can do. Let's actually pop back to the map. The first is you can invade. So areas that are not home areas can be invaded. So the Russians, can't remember if they can invade East Russia, they might not, it might be a home area. Invasions in themselves don't bring you victory but they do provoke battles, big battles, uh, which could help your war winning strategy. And then lastly, you may get invitations to contribute to the land offensive. That's always a very poor exchange. You only ever see like a hundred points or something from a major land uh, offensive, which is trivial in comparison to the kinds of points you could get winning a naval battle. Um, if we had allies, they also might contribute victory points. But again, these tend to be a few hundred here, a few hundred there, and pretty small potatoes, really. So that's it for war winning strategies. Win battles, blockade, raid with cruisers or submarines, do invasions to seize land and also provoke bigger battles and avoid giving any assistance to the army. So wartime construction. Under construction, we've got the Hansa. It's gonna take 25 months. I doubt this war is going to last just over two years. So you could quite legitimately halt construction on the Hansa, which substantially increased our monthly balance. The two Victoria uh, Louises are going to be 
finished in three months time so that's great so we could build other ships trouble is most other ships take a long time to be built the submarines take 14 months the nice thing about that is once they're built they're in operation they don't have a working up period but still 14 months if we just sort this by type some nice s24 destroyers they're going to take nine months to build and then having been built they're going to take another four months to um, to work up fully so a good year before they're going to be ready the armed merchant cruisers four months to build four months to work up eight months also in this particular war with russia i don't think there's any virtue to that realistically the only thing we can build that are likely to be helpful in this war are some more destroyers or small trawler minesweepers. If you go to design and pick corvette and auto build, 900 is no use, but you can go down to like 200 and bring the speed down to something sensible and the guns down to two inch guns it, none of that matters all that really matters is we want mine sweeping gear now in order to do that we'll have to lower the speed after all it is a trawler so we could get some mine sweepers in three to four months plus three to four months of working up however i'm not going to build some trawlers possibly wrong but it doesn't seem as if it's worth it for me in this war I'm going to not halt the Hansa and bring it back on. We're still increasing money, so it feels time to design another ship. Okay, I've had a look at redesigning, and there's nothing that really takes my fancy. So I'm going to let this funds increase a little bit, push it a couple of months, see if I get any new researches, play it by ear. Sometimes... You just don't want to necessarily build very much, particularly in this early game where you don't want to add to obsolescence. So that's winning strategies and construction. We've talked about deployment, but really in this game, because it's small, we are all just stuck in the Baltic. So the final two bits are deciding whether you're going to fight the battles or not and deciding about peace. So first of all, the battles. Every time there's a battle, you are given the option to decline. You get an intelligence assessment of the battle, which just reminds me, every time you go to war, you need to push up your intelligence to high. That will help you not be surprised and create more favorable battle opportunities for yourself. In fact, I probably should have pushed that up whilst we had a tension 10. Um, so you get a little dialogue box popping up telling you what the battle is about is it a convoy attack is it a coastal raid is it a fleet engagement it gives an approximation of the forces in that sea area and it gives you the opportunity to decline and how many victory points that will cost you usually the several hundreds say 400 for a smallish battle 750 ish for a medium battle could go up to 1250 that kind of number for a fleet engagement i don't normally decline battles unless i am really winning big and i don't want to fight some sorts of battles for example destroyer against destroyer engagements can be really difficult they're hard to hit with guns they're hard to hit with torpedoes you sprawl around and zoom around all over the place doing not very much and they tend to end up being draws and for the sake of actually my time declining and losing a few hundred points is neither here nor there you also have the opportunity to decide whether you are going to accept two cruisers a raider and a trade protection cruiser having an engagement so if the russians send out raiders and i've got some cruisers on trade protection It'll ask me, do I want to auto-resolve that or do I want to fight it out? Depends on the ship. If it's clearly mismatched in my favour, I will auto-resolve it. And if it's clearly mismatched 
in, in the enemy's favour, then I might well try and fight it out in order to try and escape. And if it's even, it will just depend on the war situation that's how it's doing, and I might just roll the dice and see how that goes. If we have a little look at how our fleet is doing. Everything is good, hooray, except for the three Leipzig, which have just returned with their better fire control. It is required by us over here to maintain seven ships on trade protection. Normally, I would use the minesweepers or all of my corvettes onto trade protection which is here oops you can also do it by just selecting them and just pressing t and that will put them all into trade protection and we need another so i'm going to put a nymph onto trade protection as well have i accidentally picked oh yeah i've accidentally picked up a destroyer if you press a that will put it back to the active fleet so that's seven on trade protection. If there were a lot of submarines around, I would increase that number. I would put some destroyers because I don't have enough corvettes at the moment. I would want, you know, double or possibly even triple the number of ships on trade protection than the minimum requirement. So you can see here the war results, victory points, enemy victory points. Are you fulfilling the trade protection? What's your level of anti-submarine warfare at the moment? What policy are your submarines following? Obviously, I have no submarines, but they could support the fleet, in which case they also do a little bit of trade warfare, sinking enemy ships, but they are primarily looking out for enemy warships. Prize rules, where they are doing trade warfare, but in a sustainable way that doesn't annoy neutral countries in particular, or of course, unrestricted which can annoy neutrals. Now, as you can see here, we're reasonably balanced. We've got good-ish relations with most countries. Sixes, fives, I think that's a three. So we're unlikely to really annoy them enough. But as I say, we haven't got any submarines, so the point is moot. And then finally, the target for any invasion. And that's pretty much it. Decide who or if you can invade anybody. Actually, just to continue that thought, one thing I could do would be to send a force out from Northern Europe, where they all currently are, and send it to Northeast Asia. You may have heard this one before, but this is a German fleet, uh, totally different. Currently, the Russians have no ships in this area. There's only the Japanese Navy. And then I could plan to invade good old Port Arthur here, or I could invade Sakhalin Island, but I couldn't invade the Far East. So I would have to send a fleet there. You can't just invade with no ships in the area. And obviously it would take one, two, three, four, five months to make the journey. I'm not going to do that because it would weaken my opportunities to mount a successful blockade. As you can see, the margin here isn't large. It might not even be large enough at the moment to actually secure a blockade. And so obviously sending some cruisers off to the Far East would severely restrict that. So all that remains to be done is press the turn marker and see what happens next. And what should happen is a battle will occur. And if you accept and fight that battle, then that's probably it for the month plus the usual intelligence and some research finds and a bit of spying and all the usual stuff. If you decline the battle, it will usually offer you another battle. And if you decline that, it may well ask if you want to do a third battle. So that's something to bear in mind. It may only be a couple of hundred points, but then if you've declined three, it could be six or seven or 800 or more points. Finally, just a few words on peace. Don't be greedy there's always another chance to fight a war, particularly with your neighbours. Long wars are really bad because although your budget increases in wartime, your expenses increases and you may well lose expensive ships too. Now, this is true for your enemy as well, so that kind of evens it out. However, every other nation gets a boost to its economy and its naval budget during wartime. And as a consequence, they're not experiencing any of the costs 
The longer you're at war, the longer you are stuffing money into the coffers of rival navies. Secondly, remember that your victory points that will be recorded here is only loosely coupled to what happens in the piece. Now, way back in guide one, when we talked about setting up the game, if you chose to do harsh peace deals, that will make that coupling tighter so that big victory point leads tend to produce big victories with lots of victory points that you can spend on grabbing colonial possessions from your enemy or reparations that feed your economy. But played naturally without the harsh deals, you may do very well, but you may have a huge victory point lead and they agree a stalemate piece. After all, you're only the Admiral. So don't hold out for huge margins on the assumption that that's going to necessarily produce a big peace deal in your favour. The only reason I can think of for passing by what would seem to be a reasonable victory margin when peace is offered is if there's an invasion you want to do that hasn't come about yet. So that's it for how to manage the Navy in wartime, except for the little slight detail of fighting your battles, which is what's going to be next. Join me for the final part of this absolute beginner's guide to rule the ways too. Thanks for watching.